Hello, and welcome to our lecture on tips for dealing with anxiety in the season of COVID. My name is Lauren Bennett, and I'm a neuropsychologist here with the Pickup Family Institute for Neuroscience, and we're thrilled to have you with us this evening. First, we want to start by acknowledging that this is a little bit of an unusual format for us to be sharing these tips with you. We hope that you will participate by typing in any questions that you might have throughout the lecture. So there should be a box next to the, uh, the video screen, so if you're interested or have any questions, feel free to type them in, and we'll do our best to answer them throughout the lecture or at the very end. So let me begin by saying that uncertainty is one of the most difficult emotions to manage, and certainly there's been a lot of uncertainty in this season. You are not alone in feeling that way. Changes in sleep, eating, activity patterns are all common and normal responses to uncertainty. Anxiety actually serves a function. So when we look at it from a brain-based perspective, what we know is that we're wired to predisposed, if you will, to scan our environment for any kind of dangers or fears. So anxiety is a very normal response for how we might respond in unknown or uncertain situations. You also might recognize from your high school and college days that anxiety serves a function of motivation for many of us. So you might remember the night before an exam, getting that burst of adrenaline and helping to study. Anxiety is functional in that sense as well. Anxiety also serves a, a guiding purpose in terms of decision making, helps us stay away from risks and determine what the safest path might be. So in that sense, anxiety can be functional. What we want to discuss tonight is when anxiety gets overwhelming or out of that control sense, then it has less function and becomes actually more damaging in our day-to-day -day life. What we know from the research is that the challenge in these moments and the silver lining is the attempt to stay present in the moment. So when we look at research on resiliency, there's been folks who have looked uh, across different pandemics or life and world events and what we know is that folks who actually fare the best in terms of their psychological outcomes are those who are able to mobilize their supports and make full use of them in these moments. Those are the folks who are taking proactive steps to make things better. So with that in mind, I'd like to explore some common thoughts which are rooted in anxiety that will help create some tips uh, about how to balance both the calm and the challenging throughout this period. So our first common thought is, I'm scared I will get sick. I'm sure all of us have felt this in the past weeks. And these feelings of helplessness arise when negative outcomes feel beyond our control. I would challenge you to, as much as possible, include positive outcomes in your thinking. Focus on the things you are able to control that support immune functioning. Things that we know like nourishing meals, adequate quantity and quality of sleep, physical activity, devoting time each day to caring for your mental wellness, digital social connection, sticking to physical distancing, and observing other CDC and World Health Organization recommended guidelines. Acknowledge the feels of, feelings of anxiety that you might be experiencing and allow them to inform practical, evidence-based tips and behaviors rather than allowing the anxiety to build into panic. Try seeing anxiety as a contagious virus of its own. It can undermine your emotional health and well-being in this moment and the health of the system or the family that you're operating in. It's important that you take responsibility for your own state of calm, not only for your own wellness, but for that of the, the wellness of those around you as well. The next thought you might be experiencing is, I'm worried about my loved ones. This is very related to our last thought about worrying about your own health. It's entirely normal to feel heightened concern for your loved ones, particularly if you have older parents, you might be an older parent, if you have uh, loved ones who are, have a compromised immune system, these feelings are all very normal. The concern for us is if they begin to become overwhelmed by that anxiety about your loved one's health. In those moments, it might be helpful to recall that you're actually already quite skilled at managing uncertainty in day-to-day -day life. For example, every time we drive a car or cross a street, the difference is, is that we're actually quite used to managing anxiety and that uncertainty in our day-to-day -day lives, which may be why it feels so natural to put on a seatbelt, for example. 
It's especially important to ensure your emotional support system is in place during this time. So continue to call, text, video chat your loved ones. I can't tell you how many folks I've talked to who've attempted to Zoom or use FaceTime for the first time with larger group family uh, chats or with friends. That's so wonderful in this season. Also, do your best to create spaces that for conference calls or video calls um, where you might not have an agenda. Just a space to come together, have morning coffee, talk, be with one another. It doesn't necessarily always have to have a purpose or an agenda to those chats. Do your best in those moments to keep those interactions, interactions positive and encouraging when thinking about others. You can also find space to share feelings of anxiety, but when thinking about speaking with others, do your best to keep your interactions as positive as possible so we can support all, all of our loved ones. Also, it may be very important to reassure loved ones that you're doing well by taking the steps necessary to care for yourself. So if you're in a high-risk group, try not to give your loved ones more to worry about. I cannot tell you how many friends of mine I've talked to in the last few weeks that we've laughed about the fact that we're now flipping the tables and arguing with our parents, pleading with them to stay inside during the season. So if you happen to be an older adult or be immune compromised, please allow your loved ones and friends to step up in this season and allow them to get your groceries and take care of you in the way that they can. Here's another thought that I've heard quite often in the last few weeks. I don't feel like I'll ever adjust to the new normal. In this season, it is certainly understandable that you might feel as though you will never adjust to this new normal. There's a number of practical daily strategies that can help. To begin, I want to acknowledge that it's okay to mourn loss. Give yourself space to grieve. Canceled graduations, trips to see loved ones, missed anniversaries or birthday celebrations, career milestones. These are all things that we're missing out on during that time. And in this space, when there's so much tragedy and so much loss, these little things might not feel like it's okay to, to grieve over, to mourn over. But I want to encourage you to, to have that time and that space to really think about the losses that are impacting your life and your family. It's okay to grieve those and to give those space. More practically, day to day, what might be helpful is to think about keeping a routine and making a plan for each day as you adjust to this new normal. So organizing your time, sketching out a schedule for each member of your family in the day will give you a greater sense of control, again, in spite of this kind of sense of lack of control that we might all have. This will create a greater sense of normalcy and this new normal that we were talking about, about how our family members, how our kids, how our loved ones might come to expect their days to look. I would also encourage you to maintain family, couple, personal rituals. So these are rituals that will be able to provide you with a sense of stability, whether it be your morning coffee in the same place each day, morning meditation or sitting down for lunch or dinner as a family, blocking off family time, whether that be Friday night ordering pizza and playing games, just like you always would. Prioritize rituals that bring relaxation and calm to the whole family. Next, I'd encourage you to maintain your environment. So if you've ever been uh, in a messy home or had your desk be a mess at work, you might know that that actually furthers or contributes to a greater sense of loss of control. By keeping your physical environment organized and maintaining that sense of order, we can actually counter feelings of helplessness and give a sense of agency in these times. Focus on small projects, so it doesn't have to be something like clean the whole house. Think about breaking it down into one room a day or even one drawer a day if that's something that's uh, causing you increased anxiety. We all have that junk drawer in our house that we know might be helpful to take this time when we're able to, to tackle those small projects. I also want to encourage you to breathe. Remember the power of rhythmic diaphragmatic breathing. There, the research on what we know about breathing is that even one minute of calming deep breaths can have a profound effect on our central nervous system, lowering our heart rate, again, improving our immunity and our overall sense of well-being. Take extra downtime in this season. The stress and the uncertainty of these times are certainly exhausting. Give yourself more permission and more space to rest as needed. I also encourage you to find healthy ways to unwind. For many folks, that might be music or reading, journaling or meditating, 
And don't forget the power and the incredible joy that can come from spending time with your pets as well. There's great research on animal assisted therapy and all the uh, profound calming effects that our pets can have. Take advantage of that in this season. In the moments when you begin to feel overwhelmed, do a task that will help to bring your mind back online. What I mean by that is that when we feel overwhelmed, our logic centers within our brains tend to go offline. In those moments when we're emotionally overwhelmed or panicking, this is part of the flight or fight response you may be familiar with. By choosing a task, a very practical task, like creating a schedule, putting down a to-do list on paper, engaging in a project, organizing a meal, or engaging in a family activity, we can actually calm that part of our brain that's responsible for that flight or fight response and instead bring our logical mind back online. Sure, please. How can I turn conversations with friends to negative from negative to positive? Absolutely, that's a great question. So in this time, there's a lot of overwhelming content and news, which we'll talk about in a moment here. What I would encourage you to do is to, as much as you're comfortable, keep highlighting as many of the positive things as you can. Again, not to the point where you're ignoring or diminishing the very real and very tragic losses that are occurring in this time, but keep centering yourself and your friend as much as possible, directing that conversation back onto what you can control in this time. The things that you're doing to help in your community, the things that you're doing to take care of yourself and the people you love. That would be my recommendation there. Do you want to repeat the question? Sure. The question was, what can I do when conversations with friends become more negative? How can I make them more positive or take those opportunities to redirect the conversation? Thanks for that question. So one of the other comments that I often hear is that my brain feels too wired or that I'm too anxious to sleep. Here we are. So it's understandable if you've noticed changes in your sleep pattern. That's very common in response to stress and uncertainty. In addition to having a lot on our minds, you may feel restless from being cooped up at home, and you may have had an overall shift in your schedule that's thrown your, your sleep-wake cycle into disarray. So I'd encourage you to take a step back and assess your new normal as a family, or as an individual or couple, whatever your circumstance. Look at what your current sleep schedule is and look at the sleep schedule that might work best for you and your partner or your family. The goal here is consistency. So decide on a regular schedule that would work for you in your current reality and then set regular sleep and wake times. That means trying your best to go to sleep every night at the same time, even on weekends. Same thing, getting up the same time every morning, even on weekends. What we know from the research is that setting those standard sleep-wake times can actually help to train our body when it's time to get tired and when it's time to wake up. What will also support healthy sleep cycles is limiting your bed to its central purpose, sleep. Sleep and intimacy should be the only things we're using our bed for at this point. And this goes outside of this pandemic time as well. But it's especially tempting in this season because so many of us are working from home. We're tempted to answer that first uh, email in bed or perhaps sign on to that first phone, phone call conference in the morning in bed, but I encourage you to get up out of bed and as much as you can limit your bed to just sleep and intimacy. Same thing goes for cell phones. What we know from the research is the blue light from our cell phones and other devices can be really detrimental to our sleep. So as much as you can, try to shut down those objects before you enter your bedroom. What we know as well that can be very helpful for helping to initiate sleep is a relaxing nighttime routine. So this might look different for different people, but for many folks it's a glass of herbal or cup of herbal tea, it's a warm shower, something that starts to cue your body, hey it's time to go to bed. What can be very tempting when working from home is to go immediately from work into trying to abruptly go to sleep. So try to give yourself some transition time between your work tasks, your homework tasks, your, your parenting tasks, giving yourself that transitory period before it's abruptly bedtime. Here's a big one. So the news is increasing my anxiety, but I can't stop watching the news. This is a really tough one for a lot of us right now. There has been some really interesting research in the past on folks who've been in quarantine, specifically during the SARS epidemic, 
And what we know from the, the research on those folks is that there were better psychological outcomes when folks had more consistent communication, specifically on practical information. How often to wash your hands, what symptoms to watch for. There are benefits from these productive news inputs. What we also know from the research is that the non-stop news cycle makes it very tempting to stay glued to your devices, televisions, computers, iPhones, you name it. And what we know is that the 24-7 news coverage can actually trigger our stress response. That same feeling of that flight or fight response that I was speaking to a few minutes ago, that can get triggered by constant intake of the news. Do your best to incorporate a set news schedule into your day during this period. So figure out a schedule that works for you, keeping you informed without making you excessively worried over every possible tweet. Limit your news intake to what's actually providing new information. There's no benefit from watching or listening to the same news over and over again. Most of us would benefit from doing a news check just twice a day. If you find that you're particularly anxious, it might be better to limit your news period to once a day. What many folks find helpful is to set a timer. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever makes sense for you, that gives you the time you need to actually review the news sources that you'd like to review, and then move on with your day. For most folks, it's maybe once in the morning to review things that have happened over the night, and then once in the early evening after they've finished their work for the day. Outside of your scheduled news consumption periods, do your best to limit virus talk, even with your family and friends. The reason for that is it's best if you don't let it take entire control of your day. Keep up on what you need to know and then aim to keep things as normal as possible, keeping that schedule that we talked about a few minutes ago outside of those scheduled news consumption times. I would also encourage you to look at the news sources that you're consuming. How do these sources inform your personal narrative? Most folks benefit from focusing on facts and figures rather than feelings or anxiety that might come up from reviewing emotional news reports. I encourage you to pick trustworthy, trustworthy news sources that meet your personal needs. For many folks, the, the facts and the figures can be helpful when coming from the, the CDC or the World Health Organization websites. But notice how you're feeling when you consume these various sources of news. For example, if you notice that your anxiety goes up exponentially after watching a, a television news broadcast, then perhaps consider reading news stories instead of watching the television. Most folks also find it easier to hold on to a balanced perspective when they balance their news consumption. So look for the good news in all of the news stories. Look for the stories of the helpers. Look for the good news of humans helping other humans, supporting and loving each other through these really challenging times. Your attitude is up to you. No one can adopt a positive attitude for you, but you owe it to yourself and to your loved ones to fight to stay as positive as possible, even in these challenging times. I've also had folks that have expressed concern about exercise or eating right, specifically that they haven't been during this season, which actually they know impacts not only their physical health, but also their emotional health, health in these moments. So exercise is always important, but it's essential in this time. What we know from the research is that it helps to manage stress, anxiety, and depression. There's a natural serotonin that's released when we exercise, and it's one of our most key and most essential mood stabilizers. I know we could all benefit from a little more of that now. What we also know from the research is that exercise has immune benefits as well. It can improve sleep, our energy, our blood sugar regulation, and our immune system overall. So exercise is extremely important in the season. If you happen to have gone a few days, a few weeks without exercise, try a reset. Play your favorite workout list. There's plenty of playlists available online. Look up a new video or YouTube workout. We've got a few options for you here on our Hope channel. Call a friend and do a remote workout together. You can press play at the same time and check in as you're going through. I would encourage you to try different options, something that will keep you engaged and feel almost like a treat in your day rather than another thing on your to-do list during this time. Try to get your family involved. Go for a walk into an area that's isolated if that's safe for you. 
or use the amenities that you have around home to exercise. I would also encourage you, if possible, to schedule your workout as early as you can in your day. That will have the greatest impact on your mood, your productivity, and your metabolism. Have as much fun as possible with your workouts in this time. Again, make it a, a break in the day rather than feeling like a chore. And remind yourself also that it's important to take those breaks for yourself for your mental wellness. All right, let's talk about preparing healthy meals. It can be really hard to find motivation and energy to cook during this stressful period. Do everything you can to set yourself up for success. So meal planning before you grocery shop, chopping and washing vegetables beforehand so when it's time to put a meal together, you can just pull them out of the fridge and take some of the time off. And while it might be especially tempting to consume empty calories during this time, especially when we're all so close to our pantries, pay attention to which foods make you feel your best in this moment. Keep healthy snacks available and ready to go. Try your best to stick to your three meals or whatever eating schedule you're using. Keep holding on to the idea that food is fuel for you, again, to feel your best and do your best in this time. And remember that excess of alcohol consumption lowers your immunity, negatively impacts your sleep, and can slow your metabolism. Here's another common one in this moment. I feel like I'm failing at doing it all. For many, what you're being asked to do in this season is humanly impossible, especially for you parents. So working, parenting, teaching are three entirely different jobs that cannot be done at the same time. As a starting point for all of us, I want to remind you that you're not working from home. You are at home during a crisis trying to work. Our highest priority in this moment is safety. Your focus has likely been on the physical and psychological security of you and your family, as it should be. So I would caution you and, and encourage you to watch out for all the shoulds that might be popping up in your life. I should already have my pantry organized. I should have already revised that latest draft of a report that I'm working on. I should have already had that project done. Give yourself grace. This is a very tough time. It's not hard because you're doing it wrong. It's hard because it's absolutely too much. Once we all feel more stable, our bodies and minds will adjust to this new normal. This mental shift might make it possible to return to higher level work and creative outlets, but the timeline will be different for each person. With time, it will be easier to embrace the new normal, but give yourself grace on that journey. Be gentle with yourself. And where you can, again, lower expectations if possible and appropriate in this moment. When you're tackling your to-do list, start with the easy tasks before moving on to the heavy lifting. You'll find encouragement from checking the small things off your list and be able with time again to tackle the bigger projects. In any one moment, do the best you can, knowing that this will get better. And when you have to pick between all the hats that you wear in this moment, I would encourage you to choose connection. Pick playing a game with your kids over arguing about an academic assignment. Pick teaching your child or partner to do the laundry rather than feeling frustrated that they're not contributing to the household work. And do your best in this day, in these days, to find a few minutes of quality time. First with yourself, with your partner, if partnered, and with your family. By carving out small spaces to be together in these times, you'll find that you're not alone. Reach out to your community, stay connected, and ensure that you're prioritizing your mental wellness in this season. Your loved ones will perceive that you're investing in yourself, and you and they will all be better for it. What about, I feel like I'm not doing enough to help? The reality is simply by staying at home and following the public health advisories, you're protecting the lives of others. Take a moment to recognize your contribution. And if you have the desire and the means to do more, consider community-based giving where the impact will be the greatest and the most immediate. Think about making clocks masks if you're able. Donate meals or supplies to those in need. Support hospitality workers or other community businesses that might be impacted. 
Think about making cards for older adults living alone or in assisted living facilities. Call on your neighbors who may need support. Connect with friends who might be having a tough day. All of these are ways to feel like you're connected to the greater community here and to give back. There's no gesture that's too small and just being able to encourage one another is one of the greatest gifts we can do. And what about the fact that there are folks out there who might feel like they need more? This season is immensely challenging and chaotic. I wanna encourage you to watch for signs of changes in mood in yourself and your loved ones. Those are things like changes in your sleep, appetite, energy level, and ability to concentrate. You might notice that you're more tearful, more irritable, and you might feel a sense of hopelessness. If you find that you or your loved ones might benefit from additional support, I would encourage you to reach out to who and what helps you. Turn to the people in your life who you know are supportive and can listen. Talk about your anxiety if it helps you, or talk about the things that can help you regain a sense of calm. If you were previously engaged in therapy or support group and think you might benefit, or if you think you might benefit from additional support now, look for telehealth options. And if you feel like you or a loved one might benefit from additional support, I have a list of resources that I'd like to share. So these are for general mental health needs, and specifically the first list here is for non-crisis needs. So there's an organization here in our community called NAMI, and there's several chapters of it across the country. So I'll be speaking about the Orange County specific line. And the phone number there is 714-991-6412. They also have live chat available if you prefer to chat with someone online at NAMI, which is N-A-M-I-O-C, Org. I also want to highlight the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Disaster Distress Helpline. You can call 1-800-985-5990. There's also an OC line for our Behavioral Health Department. It's just a general resource line that you can call if you know that you have a need but aren't sure where to start. And that phone number is 855-OC-LINKS which is L-I-N-K-S. If you or your loved one are experiencing any suicidal thoughts or any thoughts of self-harm, there are a few resources that I wanna highlight. The first is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And the phone number there is 1-800-273-TALK, which is 2855. You can also text TALK to 741 741 for free anonymous 24 7 crisis support from anywhere in the u.s i want to highlight that a number of the organizations that support uh, substance abuse or chemical dependence are also offering remote uh, support group meetings so alcohol alcoholics anonymous and narcotics anonymous are both uh, providing on, on online support and phone support for participants, so feel free to visit their websites for more information on those resources. Sadly, there has been an increase in intimate partner violence during the season, and I want to encourage that if you or your loved ones might benefit from any support with domestic violence, there is a hotline available to you, 800-799-7233. And then finally, the last resource I wanted to highlight is, this is specific to NAMI OC again, so at namioc.org backslash COVID-19 info. And there's a list of all of the available resources available through their organization and other organizations, as well as some financial assistance resources there. We thank you so much for joining us. Again, we acknowledge what a challenging and chaotic period this is for all of us. 